Good morning and welcome to church. It's great to see everyone here. If you're outside, please come in. We'd love you to join us. Um, we really want to welcome Ryan and Lynn and Alicia and John and Imogen this morning. It's great to have you here and we really look forward to hearing from you. So please stand as we start our service. We're going to lift our voices to the Lord. So let's sing up big.
Take a seat, friends. Welcome, church. Welcome today as we gather. It's great that you're here. I want to just say we're seeing Mission Sunday on the screen in front of you. But something more significant happens every Sunday morning. And that is we acknowledge our God. And... uh, I just want to say that's important to do, and we acknowledge where we stand before him. I also, in a moment, we're going to pray that, but I just want to acknowledge you're here today, and it's great that you're here, and it's great for those who have joined us online at home, and I'm so pleased that you're part of us today. Well, we need to acknowledge God, and uh, let me do that, and Something perhaps we haven't done enough is we need to acknowledge, uh, it's a good Anglican thing to do, I guess, but uh, acknowledge that we have sinned and ask for forgiveness before we proceed any further. Let's pray. Our God and Father, you are so kind and loving and beautiful and all-powerful and righteous and pure. And we just want to honour you in our hearts this morning. And as we gather, it is with sadness we reflect that so often we fall short. We sin, whether deliberately or unintentionally. And we are so sorry for this, Father. And we we thank you that Jesus has come and wiped away all our sin and forgiven us. And we're so grateful for that. And Lord, as we gather here this morning, may we have a sense of your presence and power and love today. And as we reflect upon the world that you have made and placed us in, may we liken our passions and desires to be aligned with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, uh, Mission Sunday, we're looking at how we serve God in our place right where we are now, or nationally or internationally, and in particular, we'll be uh, uh, hearing uh, from Brian Verghese as he opens the scriptures about remembering God and obeying him and loving him and passing on uh, the faith to others. 
And I think this is going to be a really anointed time as we reflect upon, well, what are we doing? How can we partner in mission? You see, God has a passion for us and a passion for his world. And so I would like, and I'd hope it would be the case, that today we warm our hearts to the things of God. Well, there are a number of things we're doing, and uh, just to say, if you're new today, great to have you here. And my name's Jeff Bates, and I'm the senior pastor here. And uh, uh, there are many things we're going to be doing, but uh, right now I'm going to... uh, we're going to see a video before Ryan comes up and, and Lynn. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's look to the screen. Bonjour. We are Ryan and Lynn McGee's. And with our children, we will be going to Seychelles to serve Jesus with CMS. Seychelles is made up of around 115 islands and is known for its beautiful beaches and unique plants and wildlife. Legend has it that somewhere in the islands there is buried treasure left behind by pirates. Most Seychelles wild would describe themselves as Christian, but far fewer would say that they follow Jesus. Christian leaders in Seychelles have identified that despite many going to church there, there's a big disconnect between biblical teaching and how people live. In this tiny country, there are very few men and women with theological training. The Anglican Church of Seychelles has asked for CMS work. We're excited to accept this invitation to help grow disciples in Seychelles. As well as preaching and ministering on Sundays, We'll be looking for ways to encourage believers to follow Jesus in their daily life. We'll also be working with theological students, helping to translate their learning into practical application. There is buried treasure in Seychelles. It's the gospel. Will you join us in praying for a Seychelles that knows Jesus? Perhaps when you see a seashell, you might be reminded to pray for us and the people of this beautiful country. Will you also consider partnering with us financially? Your generous support will enable us to grow disciples in Seychelles. Thanks, Ryan and and Lynn. And your delightfully growing family. Welcome, welcome here. All right. Now, you guys aren't strangers to us. I believe, um, if I remember right, is it 2008 to 2014, Ryan, Yeah, that's here? right. That was my time here. Okay. That's good. So, yeah, it was a lovely time. Uh, so what have you been doing since then? Uh, a few different things. Uh, so when we got married, we went to a church together in our local area, West Ride. Uh, I did a ministry apprenticeship. Um, I, I was working as an accountant uh, and then did a ministry apprenticeship at Sydney University on campus. Uh, and then studied at Bible College most recently. And then the start of this year, we were in Melbourne uh, with CMS, uh, spent six months doing cross-cultural training um, up there. Yeah. Terrific. Down and, there. Uh, and we have follow- been following you, and it's been kind. Now, um, Lynn, we're going to try something risky, are we, right now? Okay. Sweetheart, what's your name? Alicia. Alicia, how old are you? Four. That's lovely. What's your brother's name? John. And how old's John? <laughs> Good job, John. <laughs> that was unrehearsed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Alicia, do you, do you remember what your little baby's called? Imogen. And, and how old's Imogen? Three months old. Wow. Thank you very much. Well, um, there are a lot of things we, we're going to talk about and... Uh, not only today, but during the week. But let's talk about the Seychelles and uh, what are the gospel needs in the Seychelles? So that's what's driving you guys. So tell us what they are. Uh, hello, thank you so much for having us. Uh, there are huge gospel needs in Seychelles. Uh, it's a country that you may not have heard of. It's off the east coast of Africa. It's a very small uh, group of islands. And it's a place where uh, there's a... The leaders there have identified a real lack of trained, uh, theologically uh, sound 
Christian leaders for the churches. Uh, so they've been asking, the, uh, the Bishop of Seychelles has actually been asking CMS Australia to send people for years and no one's been able to go. And so uh, Ryan and I have accepted this invitation to head over there. Uh, we'll particularly be hoping to care for um, a flock there as well as uh, caring for other ministers around us and training them as well in how we can handle the Bible really well. I must admit, Seychelles doesn't sort of fit mo on most people's radar, all right? It's, it's, uh, it's our ignorance and uh, our issue on this, but what are the challenges for ministry in the Seychelles? Yeah, um, there's a few. Uh, I think uh, the, the big thing is, you know, we're um, going to a place where they, they aren't used to the way that uh, we read the Bible or preach from it. They, they, they don't think about what we call biblical theology. I'll explain a bit more of that in the sermon as well. Uh, and so there's just, um, uh, not just challenges maybe, but opportunities uh, for people to grow in their understanding of how to read God's Word, how to see Christ at the center of it all, even the Old Testament, and how that is good news for us as Christians. Um, I think that's kind of the ministry challenges, but probably, you know, part of that for us as a family is just how do we do ministry in a context where we don't have the normal support networks that we usually have, a loving family and friends and church, uh, lots of people who think kind of similar to us and kind of help us in our Christian faith. We've got to work out how to do that on our own a lot more. Uh, and particularly challenges for our kids in, uh, you know, we're going to a place where there's not a thriving kids ministry or youth ministry. Uh, and so we'd love for you to join us in praying that uh, God would raise up little Christian friends for our kids uh, who might be able to spur them on to follow Jesus in this different context. So how do we pray for you? How do we partner for you guys? Uh, yeah, well, we actually are going and we do think that it's God who gives the growth. And so uh, he is a God who listens and he cares and he acts. And so would you please talk to him for us. Would you please join us by praying? Uh, please pray for our family, and please do pray for the people of Seychelles. Please, uh, yeah, pray that people who don't know Jesus would come to know him. Please pray for great growth in godliness and ministry skills. Um, that would be a great way of partnering with us. Uh, we send out monthly prayer updates, and so if you have a look on that back table, uh, there's a QR code um, on the banner and there's prayer cards where you can sign up to receive those monthly prayer updates. We would really, really appreciate uh, you partnering with us in prayer. We'd be so grateful. Uh, we also need financial support uh, to enable us to do life and ministry overseas and to free us up from needing to look for employment while we're there. And so if you're uh, open to that, we would love you to financially partner with us as well. And you can follow that same QR code uh, to sign up for that too. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I'm, I'm conscious whenever children are on the platform, we're, we're, it's a delightful distraction, aren't they? <laughs> Well, look, we're going to have the opportunity during the week uh, in a number of life groups, and uh, you're coming back later in the year to focus. So we're, you're going to be around, but when are you leaving to go? January next year, Lord willing, yeah. So we haven't booked flights yet because lots of flights are still in flux with COVID and that sort of thing, but we're hoping late Jan we'll be on a plane. All right, All right. one last thing, thank you. Um, we're, we're going to talk about partnership in our life groups this week, and that'll come at announcement time, but how, how, how many people live in the Seychelles? 100,000, so not big. Okay, 100,000, yep. right. Okay, and it's, it's a delight that you've seen that God's called you to be there and make a difference, and that's what people need to, to know and, and live, so bless you for that. Look, um, you're, you're going to step down for a minute, but let me pray for you right now, yeah. Our God and Father, I thank you for Ryan and Lynn and these kids who are going out to serve you in a different location. I pray you would protect them. I pray that you would direct them. And I pray that you would bless them. And so, Lord, I ask that as they eventually get there in January and beyond, that they'll settle in and uh, make a real difference for you. And of today, as they share with us, may we uh, be open in our hearts and minds 
to the things of God we need to hear and do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, these guys are going separate directions to either Kids Church and Ryan's going to preach. So, thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. And Emily's going to lead us in prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbly, knowing we do not deserve you, and we ask for your forgiveness. We praise you that we can do so confidently for you, our love, and through Jesus, your forgiveness has been freely given to us. Thank you for welcoming us into your family and blessing us with everlasting joy. On this Mission Sunday, we pray for CMS. Thank you for the work they do in sharing your love across the globe, sending people out to glorify your name and make disciples of all nations. We pray for the missionaries in the field. Please bless and encourage them in their ministries. May you give them the joy of seeing their work bear fruit. May you work through them so that more people can experience your love and forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. Please help us to support all our link missionaries, prayerfully, financially, and in friendship, so that they do not feel alone in this work, but they may find joy in you and in the family of believers. We pray especially for Ryan and Lynn and their family as they prepare to move to Seychelles as missionaries. We praise you for your work in their lives and their willingness to serve you in this way. Please be preparing them physically, emotionally, and spiritually for the work you have planned for them. Give them your love for the people they will meet and help them to be bold and wise in sharing your gospel. May they always look to you in the joys and the struggles, knowing you are in control. Please soften the hearts of those they will meet so that the people of Seychelles may know truth and have real and lasting relationships with you. Help us to support them and love them and care for them and partnering with them in this work. We pray for those closer to home. We pray for those among us teaching scripture in the local schools. Please strengthen and encourage them to keep doing this each week. May the local schools grow in their love for you and children's lives be forever changed because of your love, that they will know you and choose to follow you. We pray for all the ministries here at Life. Please help us to remain faithful to you, not working in our own strength, but yours. And may you use this church as you will, growing us in faith, love, and number. Please help us all where you have placed us, in homes, workplaces, friendships, schools, and communities, to be lights shining your good and holy name. Give us all your heart for the lost, and work through us so that your name may be praised and people saved. Amen. As people who love Jesus, our hope is built on nothing less and nothing more than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Please stand and sing with us.
now to read God's Word and to share and as we see what He has to say to us. And the reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. So, beginning of Deuteronomy, Moses, of course, God has led the Israelites out of Egypt and uh, He's now, in the previous chapter, He's given them the Ten Commandments, a repeat of what, he, what is written in Exodus, of course, and now He moves into the law and describes to the people what it is to live as people of God. So, Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. These are the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that you, it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, I'd love to tell you a little bit about my story. And uh, my story kind of starts uh, you know, even before me, you know, I'm part of a family and um, that uh, shapes who I am and uh, the kind of person God has made me to be. And uh, in that photo you can see my grandfather, my grandparents uh, at my baptism. Hopefully you can recognize me, I'm the cute one over there. Um, and there's me at my uncle's wedding uh, and um, yeah, again, the cuter one in red, not the you know, hideous one in blue, that's my brother. Um, I remember uh, an incident when I was seven or eight, where my grandfather, he sat me down, and he told me that he was praying for me. And he said to me, he said, my grandfather was a Christian minister, my father was a Christian minister, I am a Christian minister, my son, the one in the blue suit, he is a Christian minister. 
but none of my grandchildren have shown any interest in Christian ministry. And so I'm praying that you will be the minister amongst the grandchildren generation. Seven or eight. And here I was thinking, why me? I just want to be a train driver or an astronaut. And here he is praying these lofty prayers for me. I felt the pressure. And I thought at the time, well, I I thought for a long time since then, that he was just uh, saying that to all the grandkids and hoping one of it would catch. He was just spreading, you know, the, uh, the, the prayers and hoping one of them would stick. I, I told the story uh, last year, and my cousin heard it, and she said, no, he was targeting you. <laughs> he didn't say that for any of the rest of us. Even though it wasn't an active part of my decision-making for ministry, I really do think God worked through my grandfather's prayers, that God was working in my heart to grow a love for him, for his word, and passing on that good news to more people. And the prayers of my grandfather really put my own kind of middle-class prayers for my kids to shame. Because I usually just stop at praying for my kids to be comfortable, for them to have stability, for them to uh, have a Christian faith. But I don't really ask boldly that God would get them to be sacrificial, to be all in on their faith and seek to serve him beyond what is comfortable. For those of you who don't have kids, how often do you pay for the kids and youth of this church? that they would have a devotion to the Lord and that they would pass on what they've heard to the next generation. Because we're part of a spiritual family together, aren't we? It's not that we've outsourced the ministry to the kids' leaders or the youth leaders, or we've said, oh, it's the parents' responsibility to grow the children in their faith. We have a responsibility together to help the next generation know and love and serve the Lord with their whole heart. You see, my grandfather, it was really clear all through growing up that he was captured by a love of Christ. I could see that the ways that it permeated through his whole life, and part of the responsibility he felt of receiving the rich treasure of the gospel was that he prayed and he passed it on to the next generation. As Tony mentioned, uh, this passage that we're looking at, it comes from Deuteronomy, and this chapter is actually one of the most significant chapters in the whole Bible. And the key thing that it says is that the only God, the one true living God, he requires a wholehearted worship. This is something that I want to encourage you in today, and something that we're hoping to hold too tightly when we go to Seychelles, because it's good news for the whole world to hear. Uh, Let me pray for us, and then we'll look deeply into the passage. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. Let your word be our rule and guide, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I wonder what you think wholehearted worship of God looks like. I want to say that it's more than our mere attendance. It's more than showing up on Sunday or coming along to Bible study. It's something that is more than even just our daily devotional life. It's something that needs to permeate our whole lives, our hearts, our minds, our strength. And there's a challenge in hearing something like Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, because uh, it's hard to know how how do we live that. Well, uh, as I said, this book is one of the most significant books in the Bible. And in the book, Moses is kind of giving his final word. He's led the people of Israel for more than 40 years, and he knows that he's not going to be able to get into the promised land because God has forbidden him from entering And so he's preaching a series of sermons, a a, a few things 
that he wants people to have before, this new generation to have before they enter the land. His purpose is to remind this new generation of Israelites, people whose whole lives have been filled with wandering through the desert, he wants them to remember that they have a special relationship with God. So in verse 1 of the passage, he begins by talking about the book as a whole. He says that the laws that are given are what God told him to teach the people before they enter into the promised land. And he reminds them that throughout the chapter, they are the laws that God has given them and that it's in preparation for the land that God is about to give them. It's not things that they have earned themselves. It's not something that they are entitled to. It's something that God in his kindness, in his mercy, in his grace, is giving as a gift to his people, this land that he's prepared for them. And the, the description of the land is really abundant. It's full of blessing. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. When I was a kid, I used to imagine it just like quite a sticky place to go on. Because you're like, you know, one step you're walking through milk, your feet are getting met, and then suddenly you're in honey, and then you're like stuck on. It, it's not literally, obviously. You probably already have figured that out. Full of milk and honey on the ground. It's just speaking to the abundance that it just produces uh, in, in this desert climate. There's a land that produces plenty, and God is saying he will bless them with that land. Uh, and in verses 2 and 3, Moses makes it really clear this promise is not just for them, but it's actually for the generations after them as well. And there are four key actions that come out of these verses for them. They are to fear, keep, hear, and obey. Moses' reminder is that if they obey, they will increase great, greatly in this land. Not only will their land give them much blessing, but they will be blessed as a people. They will be prosperous. And in a time where uh, wars were fought and it really mattered how many numbers you had in your nation, the promise of blessing of a, a, a large people was a way, again, that God was going to keep and protect his people. And in verse 4, we get the million-dollar verse. Uh, the, the Jewish people call this verse the Shema uh, because that's the word that means listen. And uh, it's a verse that the Jewish people treasure uh, even today. Observant Jews would recite, recite the verse twice a day. Here, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Twice a day, every day, they would say that as a reminder of the character of God. Now, I think you guys have just done a series on the Trinity, so I, I won't have to explain why even using a verse like this is true for us as Christians. God is one. He is a unity in three persons. And the unity of God was highlighted to contrast with all the multiplicity of gods in the nations around them. But it also speaks to the uniqueness of God, his exclusivity, he is not one of many. He is the only God. All the other gods are false gods. Therefore, Moses challenges them in verses 5 uh, to love God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their strength. And verses 6 to 9 are all descriptions of how Moses wanted these truths to be everywhere. When they wake, when they sleep, uh, when they're talking about it with their kids at home, when they're going out on the road, it's just supposed to be a normal part of their lives, not just an add-on that happens on Saturdays or Sundays. Now, Jews took this pretty literally, this charge to keep them uh, somewhere on their bodies in their homes. Uh, they have these things called phylacteries, which is this little box that they keep on their head. And inside that little box is a scroll of the Shema. So it would always be a reminder of the unity, the uniqueness of God. But in their houses as well, they had a thing called a mezuzah, 
which was a little thing. Again, a scroll was in there with the Shema. This kind of literal interpretation was uh, supposed to help them keep that focus that uh, God is supreme, that he is one, that he is unique. But the danger is that with things like this, sometimes it becomes a superstition. You can, you can kind of do the practice without believing the belief. And uh, people got so superstitious that some people, you know, they would touch or kiss the mezuzah as they enter the house to receive some blessing uh, without really thinking about the content of what's inside that box. See, the purpose Moses has in mind is not that you wear this and you walk around or uh, that, uh, you know, it's a visible sign to everyone that you are God's people, but it's a constant reminder that you have this exclusive relationship with God. Now, as, as we look at Deuteronomy 6 on Mission Sunday, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with mission? Why preach this as a mission sermon? Surely something like Matthew 28, the Great Commission, that's a mission sermon. Or Romans 10, how can uh, people hear unless someone is sent? That's a mission sermon. But actually, in Mark 12, 29 to 30, Jesus says that this is the greatest commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. This is the main game of mission. We want to promote wholehearted worship of God. We want to promote that here in Quakers Hill. We want to promote that in Sydney, in Australia. And we certainly want that to be a reality in Seychelles. The truth is, when we go to Seychelles, we'll want to preach this again and again. As Lynn mentioned, as you saw in the video, there seems to be a lot of evidence that the churches are full of people who might be there physically, but not mentally or in their hearts that they might be calling themselves Christians because of their grandparents, but that they don't actually have a wholehearted worship of God. In fact, they might even go to church on Sunday, but the stereotype is that when they have problems in this world, that they go to the witch doctor on Wednesday, and they don't see any kind of tension in holding those things together. We want to encourage Seychelles to a wholehearted worship of God. But it's not a truth that only Seychelles needs to hear, is it? We too need to be reminded of it time and time again. So how do we apply a passage like this? What does that mean for the way that we live our lives? Now, I don't know if you normally do this in your church, so uh, we're going to try something. I've got a question on there. How would you apply this passage? Talk to someone next to you for about a minute. Have a go. You might be wrong. That's okay. We're learning together. You might be right, and you can tell me that I'm wrong later, and that'd be great too. Um, so spend about a minute. Talk to the people next to you. What do you do with something like this for the way that you live your life? Talk to people around you. See you in a minute. Right. I realize, you know, I've had a lot more time to think about this and prepare, so, you know, good job on having those conversations, and if you had something different to what I had, that's fine. I uh, would love to talk to you about it, and uh, we can share a bit about it. Um, there's lots of ways people read the Bible, and uh, uh, 
sometimes uh, I think we misapply passages, and particularly from the Old Testament. Uh, I think we're very comfortable with the New Testament, but when the Old Testament happens, we go, well, what do we do here? Like, uh, it's kind of written to a different people. How do we, how do we apply this? Uh, so here's a, a warning. This is not a real application, okay? So I'm going to say some things, but, you know, don't, don't take them too much to heart. It's more like an I- illustration of an application. Okay, here, here's my not real application. Uh, one of the things that can happen when we read a passage like this is that we can feel guilty. We have failed to love God as we ought, and we need to do better. We, the reason we don't have all of God's blessings, the reason we're in debt or things are going crazy in our house, is that we haven't kept our end of the bargain. What ways have you failed to live up to God's standards recently? Fake application. Keep paying attention. Maybe instead of loving God with all your heart, you've let the love of money corrode your heart instead. Maybe instead of loving God with all your mind, you've let your mind wander to fantasize about that coworker. Maybe instead of loving God with all your strength, you've exhausted your energy playing social soccer, and so on Sunday when you come to church, you're knackered. And you, you don't have any more to give to God. Well, this is your wake-up call, fake application. This is your wake-up call. Give away your money, quit your job, stop playing soccer. You need to focus completely on God instead. You need to do more to love God rightly. Otherwise, he's going to be disappointed in you. Sort yourself out. Are you feeling encouraged? The weight of the law is a burden that we just can't lift. If that was a true application, man, we'd leave church every Sunday being exhausted. I remember hearing about a man who said he loved to come to church to hear a challenge. He wanted to be reminded of his depravity and be motivated to go harder for God every Sunday. And if if he didn't get that challenge, then what's the point of coming to church? Oh, man... I don't think that's what church is for. I mean, I think the Spirit will work in convicting us of our sin. The Spirit will convict us and challenge us. But the Christian way of reading the Bible is more freeing. Because we can't take a passage like this and that was true of Israel and just go, okay, that's the same thing for us. What is true of God's Old Covenant, Old Testament people is the same thing that is for us. Uh, There's a better way to read the Bible. Uh, It's called biblical theology, and it basically teaches us that the Bible is this one big story, that God is writing this big story, and uh, it's all about how he is trying to redeem the world through Jesus. And, And that's true from Genesis to Malachi as much as it is from Matthew to Revelation. It's the whole Bible is pointing to this one great truth, that Christ, crucified and risen, is the object of our worship, is the means of our salvation, is the way that we are enabled to live right, in a right relationship with God. One of the reasons that Seychelles asked CMS for help in sending evangelicals to do ministry there is because this is, this is a specialty of Australian theology. We didn't, we didn't invent biblical theology, but it's the thing that we've certainly done really well in uh, Australia. And so it, it's kind of the bread and butter of lots of the ways that we read the Bible. Even in scripture classes, I taught scripture here uh, in you know, 2012, and the scripture material that we used taught biblical theology to uh, year three kids. It's just part of the water we drink and the air we breathe. But the archbishop there, he wants us to come to train his people in this method of reading the Bible because they haven't been trained in any method. So they're just kind of making it up. And sometimes they do it this way, but usually by accident. They're not 
particularly thinking about how to read the Old Testament, and sometimes it means that they shy away from preaching from the Old Testament. So let me have a go at a, a, a more appropriate way, I think, to apply this passage. And I think that it is true that one of the uses of the law for the Christian is that it reveals our sin. I think uh, if you felt that conviction, it, it's right, because our sin does get in the way of loving God rightly. We keep distracting ourselves from wholeheartedly worshipping God because of our pride or our passions or our possessions, our love for our possessions. They get in the way because we're sinful people. But Deuteronomy chapter 27, at the end of the book, it states that anyone who tries to live out this law and fails is cursed. So if we try to do better, if we try to live this out, law out even in part, and we fail in some tiny way, which we've all probably failed in some way already this morning, we're, it's inevitable that we'll fail, then we have a curse put on us. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14 says that Christ redeems us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And later it says, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So it's not in keeping the law that we're safe, but in belonging to Christ. It's through him that we're safe. Jesus is the only one who has loved God truly. He's the only one who's ever obeyed him perfectly, even to death on a cross. And he gives us righteousness through our union with him. The promise for the Christian is a spiritual heart transplant. Our natural hearts are stubborn and sinful and unable to love God rightly. But God himself, he does the work that when we put our faith in Jesus, he gives us a new heart to be able to follow him. Here's the promise in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So what does loving God wholly look like for us? Well, it's a work of the Spirit. That we can even remember God and seek to follow Him is a work of God's Spirit in us. There's wisdom in the law such that we can see that there's, it's good and there are good purposes in it, but we don't have to keep it to get God's blessings. We already have all the spiritual blessings through Jesus, through the Spirit's work in us. So a passage like this, it ought to stimulate not discouragement or heaviness, but gratitude, joy that Christ has already done this work for us. The weight of the law is lifted. And a passage like this can motivate our love to seek and honor God rightly in all things. The point of loving God wholeheartedly is not wearing phylacteries or having a mezuzah in your house to remind us to love God. Although maybe some physical things, tangible things might be helpful, but it's a reminder to spring out of our changed heart. The encouragement to us to pass on this to our grandsons and sons is not an obligation but there's great wisdom, isn't there? If, if you've received this great news, this great treasure, that we want the next generation to have the same love of God. And, and lots of what we can do is teach them, but lots of what we do is pray that God will be the one who transforms their hearts in his good timing. In Christ, the reality is that we have hundreds of new family members and we are as a family together in Christ. And so there's an opportunity for us who might not have children ourselves to pray, to disciple, to encourage those in our family of faith to love Jesus wholeheartedly and to ask God that he would work in their hearts as well. 
This should stop our middle class prayers. My grandfather really understood that the wholehearted love of God and uh, it motivated him to pray bold prayers for my generation, for his grandson. And this is the hope that we have when we go to Seychelles, to encourage and train believers in the gospel and to remind them to lean on Christ for their life and godliness and not on their own strength. That's my encouragement to you here in Quakers Hill as well. Keep leaning on Christ and trust that he has done the work for you and he who began that good work in you will see it to completion. I'd love to pray for us as I end our time together. Father God, I thank you for the spiritual work that you've done in our lives. And we pray that you might work in transforming the hearts and minds of our children and our grandchildren so that they might love you because of what Christ has done for them. We pray that they might hold fast to the gospel all their days. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Ryan. Um, as we go out into our lives this week, it's a great reminder that God requires our wholehearted worship of him, wherever we are, whoever we're with, um, and whatever we're doing. So please stand as we finish uh, with our last song.
Take a seat, friends. Let me just give you some community updates that we need to know. Uh, we're coming out of winter and uh, soon, and uh, you know September's coming and Father's Day is coming. We want to honour the dads in our community, and so it's going to be a special event we're having coming up. So can I uh, encourage you if? Uh, if you have a dad, uh, bring him along on those events. And we're going to honour those dads in your family and in our community. But also, um, there are a few other things that are happening. Our discipleship classes are starting this week. And if you want to know about your faith more, if you want the key to understanding, you know, the Bible and understanding who Jesus is, these, these classes are excellent. And uh, if you're interested in being uh, involved in that, uh, there's an adult one on Friday night uh, just over in my home, and also there's uh, a Sunday night one for young adults and teenagers. So um, if you're wanting to, uh, you know, learn more about Jesus in a unique way, but also help if you're wanting to make a public profession of faith, and uh, later in the year we'll have that opportunity of... Uh, we call it celebration of salvation. It could be baptism or confirmation. Well, there are things happening also this week. We've heard Ryan and Lynn share with us, and rightly so. They're, they're our link missionaries, our church missionary society link missionaries. They're one of us. They're part of our family. And we want to connect with them and their ministry. And so they're going to be around for a long time with us, God willing. And so we need to get to know them, we need to connect with them, and we need to partner with them. And there are a number of opportunities this week to do that. There are some life groups that are meeting, but in particular there's one on Tuesday night that uh, is a combined group, and uh, I can't read it from here, but uh, it's got something to do with, uh, there's a meal, and it's right in this auditorium here, and uh, you're very, very welcome to come along and uh, you know, understand a bit more about uh, the Vergeese's ministry as we are partnering with them. So, you know, you're very welcome there to, to connect in that way. And um, finally, next Sunday, there's something we do every now and then called New to Life. If you're a newish person in our church and you want to know a bit about us, you know, what we're doing, what's our vision, what, what's our expectation and how to encourage you to take the next step, well, Next Sunday is the best time to do that, and uh, it's an afternoon tea uh, just here uh, in the St. Stephen's room, and we'd love to share with you that occasion uh, so that uh, you would, you know, understand, well, what's God calling me to do? And if you are wanting to come along to that, speak to Pastor Chacha about that, all right? Well, what's happened today are many things. It's been good, hasn't it, just to see who God is and His heart and passion and see that we are to respond to Him. And, uh, and Ryan did open the Scriptures for us, didn't he, about how that is to be. It's a releasing and a joyful thing, and not out of fear or, you know, or a way that's driven by guilt. And so that's a very helpful thing as we go from here. You know, we, we just sang a song about we, we focus on God and what are we doing with our life. And so can I encourage you this week to go and serve Him with joy and happiness now that God has called you. Romans 15 says this, and it's a fitting way to end our time. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go and have a cuppa and connect, and maybe uh, connect with the Vergeses as well. <laughs>